continue to see each other in Zoom and otherwise. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about why Aronstein trees. What are why Aronstein trees? So I think that you all know what an Aronstein tree is. It's a tree that has Aleph 1 many nodes of height Aleph 1. It also has the property that it doesn't have any uncountable branches and that all levels are countable. So uh, now a wide Aronstein tree will be exactly the same thing, but it will not have all levels countable. So it can be a thick tree, just like an Aronstein tree, but thicker. Now, what is the relevance of such trees? Why to study them? And uh, what is the relevance of MA to this problem? I'll explain that in a minute. And as, a, uh, as it was already said, this work is joined with Sahron Shela. Uh, so now the definition. A white Aronstein tree is a tree of size and height omega 1 with no uncountable branches. And let us call the class of such trees T. Now, the classical Aronstein tree becomes a particular instance of such a wide Aronstein tree because the classical Aronstein tree has all the properties that are required to be in the class T. And in addition, it has levels that are countable. So let us call the class of Aronstein tree, trees A. So A is a subset of T. Now you have probably seen many works related to Aronstein trees starting from their very beautiful construction from the 1930s, later through the work of many people, including Stanley Dorchevitz, Justin Moore, Etc. Uh, of course, you are probably thinking of MA making all iron shine trees special, which is a rather celebrated result of Baumgartner, Mallet, and Reinhardt. So much is known about the class of iron shine trees. How about this class of wide iron shine trees? The definition sounds reasonable. But the name I'm pretty sure you have not heard before, because that's a name that we invented. But the class has been around for a long while. So let me say what the point of our interest in these trees is. We want to consider these trees under the relation between trees, which is that of weak embedding. So the weak embedding is defined like this. We take two trees and we say that t is less or equal than t prime. If we can find the function f from the first tree to the second tree, such that the order is preserved, the strict order is preserved. X is y, f of x is less than f of y. I may be going to draw a few pictures to, uh, to uh, show how this looks like, why we're looking at this. So let me try to now switch to my iPad. Unfortunately, this is a little bit slow, but still it works. So what do we want to study here? We have two trees, T and t prime. And we are considering functions of this kind, f from t to t prime, which have the property that when I have a pair of points x and y in this tree, such that x is strictly below y, then f of x is strictly below f of y. They look like this. So these embeddings are called weak because they are not necessarily one-to-one. -one. So that's not really an embedding because what could happen is that we can have three points like that of the same level. And they could all go to the same point on the T prime side. That's not a problem. But notice that, however, any branch of T prime 
of t is going to be mapped into a branch of t prime. Here is t prime. So weak embeddings are embeddings between trees that preserve the branch structure of the tree. Now, why would such a thing be interesting? Let me tell you one reason that these uh, embeddings were studied. They were studied as clocks of games. So I'm sure that everybody knows what Elevified Frise games are for models of size Aleph zero. Uh, let me just remind you what it is. So when you have two models of size all of zero, you could play a game in which the good player tries to make these two models A and B isomorphic and the bad player tries to, dis to destroy the isomorphism. So the bad player chooses one point and then the good player chooses the image of that point like that. Then uh, the bad player chooses another point, oops, sorry, and the good player chooses the pre-image or the image and so forth. So these players pick points and the game lasts omega many steps and it's a very nice theorem that two countable models of first order theory are isomorphic if and only if the duplicating player has the winning, a winning strategy in this game. Now, let us erase this Aleph 1 from here and try to talk about models of size Aleph. Uh, let us erase Aleph 0 and try to talk about models of size Aleph 1. Well, we don't have this kind of equivalence between isomorphisms and partial and strategies in the corresponding EF game. So what we can do is to play different kind of games in which these two players actually have a clock. So imagine that there is some clock, some 3T, in which every time that these two players advance, they have to go along a branch of this tree. And the point is to survive in such a game. So this kind of game measures the complexity of the isomorphism between these two models. And then if there is no uncountable branch, if we are in a tree that doesn't have any uncountable branch, this means that there is no need to produce a real isomorphism, only to survive long enough. And then this relation here measures how easy it is to survive in such a game. So if there is such an embedding between T and T prime, then it is, if the good player can survive in the T prime game, then it also he or she can also survive in the game clocked by T. So these trees really appear naturally in model theory. And there is no requirement that all the levels are countable. This requirement is not really natural in this particular context. Uh, well, Aronshain trees were introduced for another reason and it is natural for them to have countable levels, but in this context, we don't really require that. But as you can see, this class of trees is quite interesting. And in fact, the problem that I want to talk to you about is something that was introduced in a paper in 1994 by Meckler and Vanannen, and they were studying exactly this type of problem. So let me go back to those slides now having given you somewhat of a background. Okay, so what, what is going to interest us really, uh, as I say, we are motivated by these Aleph-Freud Frisier games that compare models of size Aleph-1. Their study was initiated by Meckler and Van Annen in 1994. And then they had this very nice large paper on this subject. And they were interested to know if there is a maximal element in this class T under this kind of embeddings. That's usually what we call the universality question. 
So is there a universal element in the class of T? It means an element in which every other element of the class T embeds to this maximal one. So what was known? First, perhaps you know this interesting idea of Kurepa. It's uh, called the sigma functor. It's a way to transform a tree into another tree, which is called sigma of t, which consists of increasing sequences from the original tree. So using this functor, we can see that there is no universal element in either one of those classes, t or a, when we have ch. Let me show you how that works by going back to this iPad. It's unfortunate that this is a bit slow, so sorry about that. Um, but now we're going to, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so let's have a new, new page here to show you the sigma functor. So the sigma functor is like this. You have a tree T. And now you're going to make another tree, which is sigma of T. And this tree consists of all sequences rho, which are increasing sequences in T, increasing in the order of T, of course. And we order these sequences simply by initial segments. So here the sigma of T. And now it is quite easy to construct and embedding from T to sigma of T, a weak embedding. You can perhaps Excuse me. do that. Just can I have a question? Yes. So a yes, clarificatory question once again. So the elements of sigma of T are ordered under initial segments? That, uh, yes. Okay. So the point is that the, the main point of this functor is that you can never have that sigma of t embeds into a t. This can never happen. Uh, this was a, the, the thing that uh, made that, uh, that was important for Kurepa's work. He, he proved this theorem. So now, if you happen to be in the situation of CH, if you take a 3t which has size aleph 1, then also the, uh, and it doesn't have uncountable branches then its sigma also has size one, aleph one. And uh, you can see now by this fact that on the CH there cannot be a maximal element either in the class T or in the class A, because if T were to pretend to be such an element, then sigma of T would be a witness that this element is not really maximal. So under CH, there is no universal such tree. So uh, it's a very natural question now to ask what happens when we uh, go away from CH. And of course, the most natural model where CH doesn't hold is, the, is a model of Martin's axiom. So that was the motivation for in this paper. And now, uh, well, this is just repeating what I showed you on the slide. Uh, let us go to MA. So uh, unfortunately, in this paper, Meckler and Wannan had made a mistake. And they claim that MA implies that there is a universal element in this class T. And this mistake is quite subtle. If you go to their paper, you will see that what they did is to invent a very natural forcing that would add such a universal element by finite conditions. They checked that the chain condition works, but unfortunately, if you think of this for a while, you will see that the density condition, which they haven't checked very carefully, does not hold. 
And this mistake was noticed by them and by Stavo Todorcevic uh, soon, soon later after. And in fact, if you know the very nice work of Stavo Todorcevic on the class of Lipschitz trees, this class was motivated by looking at, uh, at this universality question, uh, I think. Uh, so I think this realization prompted him to study the class in which he has many results. So he has a very interesting paper which finally got published in 2007 on these Lipschitz trees. And combining results from that paper and his work on coherent trees, also in his 2007 book, to Dorchurch proved that under MA, the class of Aronshein trees doesn't have a universal element. So for Aronshein trees, there is no universal element. Now, let us look at what we are going to prove. We're going to prove that under MA, the class of Aronshein trees is cofinal in the class of white Aronshein trees. So, um, it means that the class of white Aronshein trees also cannot have a universal element. Because if we have that to have a universal element, then it would be embedding all Aronshein trees as well. Now we embed that universal element into an element of A, because A is cofinal, and we get a universal Aronshein tree, which cannot have. So this main theorem is actually a corollary of this. And as I say, the, the question was open for quite a while. I knew of it, uh, maybe I don't remember now, when is this in the late 90s that I learned about this question from your Kovananen. And we had some uh, results that were connected with it, but we didn't solve the question. And then uh, now we solved it with Tahron. Uh, and well, I, of course, after having written this paper, I have asked Stevo and Justin if they knew something about this. And um, uh, Stevo told me that by looking carefully in his proof of Lipschitz trees being co-final in A under MA, one can see that the fact that uh, the levels are countable, is not important. Uh, so one can have another proof of this main theorem too. And also, of course, uh, I'm sure this is uh, something, uh, as Devo says, he, he realized that before, but unfortunately it wasn't known otherwise. So let me show you our proof, which is different and doesn't use any extra class. It only uses the classes A and T. Sorry, can I just ask a question quickly? Yes. Uh, under CH, is does does one hold? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. I haven't thought of it. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I would imagine that using the sigma functor, you take uh, a and then you look at the sigma and. Perhaps that would help you to show that this is true to your question. Okay, so let me carry on. Uh, now I, okay, sorry. So this is the comment that I uh, mentioned about the door church. So uh, upon hearing our results, he let us know that the proofs from his paper can be made. T in place of A which then gives a different proof. Okay, so now let me talk about our paper. Our paper is available on the archive and also on our website. Uh, and it was submitted. This paper contains two main results. They are both based on new CCC forcings and appropriate families of Aleph one many dense sets. And I must say, it's sort of funny to be talking about something new that you can prove using Martin's axiom, because it's an axiom that has been around for so long and so many people 
in various areas of mathematics have proved so many things with Martin's axioms that I was sort of pleased that we could still get something out of this good old axiom. And the first result we got gives uh, another proof of the Totor Church's result that MA doesn't have, uh, does, uh, implies that A doesn't have a universal element. So as I say, he uh, used the class of Lipschitz trees. We use something uh, self-contained, that is we have, as I will explain to you, what we do is that we take uh, an element of A and force another element of A, which does not embed into it. Uh, in fact, this also gives us a new way of specializing Aronstein trees. So perhaps this forcing has some other points of interest. So I will show you this forcing. And the second theorem is the theorem that I mentioned before. And that theorem is proved by introducing a CCC forcing, which embeds a given wide Aronstein tree into an Aronstein tree. So first, let me say that when you work with such objects, it is useful to represent them somehow, uh, especially for forcing purposes. So what we're going to do is to look at A. Uh, first, we are only going to be working with normal rooted omega-1 trees with no uncountable branches. So an Aronstein tree is an omega-1 tree with no uncountable branches. Obviously, it embeds into a rooted tree because you can just put a root on the bottom of your tree and that will embed your original tree. And normal, every Aronstein tree embeds into a normal tree. And this is, uh, well, I think they also called well proof. That is something that uh, probably everybody has seen by reading Kuhn's book. Now we will also index every uh, index the elements of this tree by ordinals. So what we're going to do is to index the alpha level of the tree by ordinals in the interval between omega alpha and omega alpha plus omega, which suffices because we have countable, countably many elements. And we're going to consider the root of level minus one. So as I said, every Aronstein tree embeds into one of these forms. And I also perhaps will remind you of this requirement of what it means to be normal for a rooted tree. This just means that the limit levels are decided uniquely. So if we have two points of the same limit level, then they, if they are different, there is some level below which the, which witnesses that they are different. So if we have two points, gamma zero and gamma one, which are of the same limit level, but are not the same, then there exists some ordinal beta below both of them, below uh, the level, which is lower obviously, but it is not below both of them, it's below one exactly. So, and we also going to use a bit of a notation so we're going to be working with pairs X and Y. And these pairs are going to be coming from two trees. So two trees in A. And we're not going to consider their Cartesian product, but rather we're just going to look at the union of what we obtained as a Cartesian product of their levels. So if we look at the X and Y like that, then X and Y, have the same level in T1 and T2. And this means that they come from the same block of this type because both T1 and T2 are of this type. So therefore we can denote by alpha of XY that unique alpha, which denotes their level. And now this is a main definition, which I hope will interest you. Uh, so we're going to look at these specializing triples, which we will denote as pairs of Aronstein trees, which are getting specialized. So these are triples. We have two pairs, T1 and T2, and the function C. 
So what do they do? T1 and T2 are from the class A. And C is a function from the set of those pairs X and Y that we have just looked at. But we will only be looking at limit levels. So C is a function whose arguments are of the form X, Y, where X is of some limit level in T1 and Y is of the same limit level in T2. And this is sort of like a specializing function, but it's a little bit more subtle. So it goes to omega. Just, uh, I don't know who is in the audience. I don't see uh, everybody. I imagine there are some students. So for your benefit, let me just remind you what it means to be special. Yes, there are, there are a few students, maybe there, there are 30 something people out of which maybe you know, like 10 students or something like that. So. Oh, great. Well, that's really pleasing. And so uh, I ask the old hands to be uh, patient and to let me define everything that we do, because I would like the students to be to benefit. So for a tree to be special means that it is a countable union of antichains. So if you have an uncountable tree, which is special, this means that there must be an uncountable antichain, and therefore being a special Aronstein tree is a witness that the tree is not so slim. That's why this notion was introduced. So you can think of a specializing function as a function that partitions the tree into countably many pieces, each of which will be an antichain. And this C is going to be a function sort of like that. So what do we want from that function? So as I said, it acts on pairs X and Y from here. And imagine now that we have two X1 pairs, X1, Y1, and X2, Y2, such that C of the first is the same as the C of the second, but they are not the same pair. Then first requirement that we have is that they are not going to be of the same level. So the level of these is some alpha of x1, y1, and the level of these is some alpha of x2, y2, and they have to be different. And x1 has to be incompatible with x2 in the first three, and y1 incompatible in y2 in the second three. And now this is the main requirement. The delta of x1 and x2 in the three t1 must be diff greater than the delta of y1, y2 in t2. Uh, so let me remind you what this delta is, uh, perhaps by looking at the picture. So you have a tree, and this tree consists actually of sequences of ordinals. That is what we uh, have set up. So a typical level of this tree is something that is like that. It's countable. Let's just say this is T1. And here we have the alpha level. These are the ordinals between omega alpha and omega alpha plus omega. OK, so now we have two nodes in this tree which we have been denoted by x1 and x2. So these x1 and x2 can be considered as sequences of ordinals. And at some point, there will be a first place where these sequences are going to be different. And that place is called delta, delta x1, x2. So delta x1, x2 is the place in the tree where x1 and x2 separate. And notice that such a place must exist because we have a root. So they start the same and then they go up, they go up, they are the same. And then this is the last place where they are the same and then they separate. And what we have required in our definition of C is that when we now look at the T2, the T2 side, 
uh, then if we have that c of x1 y1 is the same as c of x2 y2 so on this side we have x2 which is of the same height as x1 and we have y2 which is of the same height as x2 uh, sorry here is y1 yeah not x2 what we are requiring is that the place where they differ on this side is actually below the place where they differed on that side. So that's our main requirement. And that's very important. If ever you studied this paper of Meckler and Wannan and where there is a mistake with density, it is exactly this type of situation that leads to the mistake. So this is very important and you will see in a second how we get to use that requirement. So let's go back to the slides. So, so the, uh, yes. Can, excuse me, can you go, come back to the slide? So yes. uh, once again, what is alpha here? Alpha is the common level of this pair. So this oh, okay, function because is they have the yes. Of course, that was the notation. Right. Thank you. Yes, yes. Okay, so now let us see some properties of such specializing triples. So first we said already that every rooted normal Aronstein tree is isomorphic to a tree in A, nothing to mention. Here is an important thing. If you have a triple like that, then both T1 and T2 are special Aronstein trees. So certainly they are Aronstein trees, but in fact, being in such a triple means that they both are special. And then another property, which is the one, the most relevant to us is that if, we have that they are in such a triple, then T1 is not weakly embeddable in T2. So you see our secret plan is that if somebody pretends to be a universal element of the class A under MA, well, what we're going to do, let us say that pretender is called T, T2, we're going to use some CCC forcing to force T2 to be part of such a triple. And then the tree T1 is going to be a witness that T2 is not really maximal. And we will be able to do this by using Aleph one many dense sets. So perhaps uh, I could just briefly talk a little bit about this proof. Uh, so let me just show you the proof of this. Uh, so I, I will actually show you the, the proof that's in the paper, so not to recopy all of this, but it, I will show you this from another screen. Okay, so uh, I hope that you can see this well. So these are these three properties. And now I'm going to talk about uh, this. First, why do we get that these trees are now special? So let us suppose that I have such a triple. And now I'm going to show you that C1 is not spe uh, spe that is special. So what I need to produce is the function from T1 to omega, which has the property that every inverse image of a point is an antechain. So we are going to produce a function D, which is going to be a specializing function from T1 to omega. So first of all, what I'm going to do is to choose for every limit delta, a point of height delta in T2, which I will call Z 
delta. So now I have an uncountable set of Mira. these points. Yes. It, it's a bit difficult to read. Can you make it a bit bigger? Okay. It's kind of dim. It's kind of dim. Okay. Let me just. Uh, Maybe just to do this. Uh, is this, yes, this yes, better? Yes. Yes. Is this yeah. better? Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now, what we have is that uh, I'm trying to construct this D, and I have now chosen these points D1 up to. Uh, sorry, I, I've chosen the points Z delta for every limit delta. Now I'm going to do a bit of coding. You see, this guy has some triples and I need to produce a function in omega. So it is reasonable that I do some coding of triples in omega to omega. So I take some bijection. And now notice that every point in X, in T1, which I can call X, is of the following form, omega delta plus omega M plus N, some N for some limit ordinal delta and some natural numbers M and N because simply every X is a limit, is an ordinal less than omega one. So we can represent it like this. So and this is a unique representation. So when I take an X, I can define D of X to be G defined. First X restricted to delta Z delta. This is well defined because this is of height delta in T1. This is of height delta in T2. And these are two natural numbers. And now I claim that this function D is a specializing function. So I need to show that I have, if I have two, well, two points, which get the same value in this mapping, dx is equal to dy, then these x and y must be incompatible or equal. So let us assume they're not equal. So I have that this equation holds. So since g is a bijection, immediately I get that m must be equal to k and n must be equal to l. And I also get that this value must be equal to this value. Now I use this important property of, uh, of C. So because X and Y are different and M and N and K and L are the same, it must be the case that beta and delta are not the same. Otherwise X and Y would be the same. So I have that these two points X restricted to delta and Y restricted to beta cannot be the same because they have a different height. Now the properties of C assure me that this x restricted to delta and y restricted to delta are actually incompatible. And therefore x must be incompatible to y. And I have seen, therefore shown that the inverse image of every point is an antichain. And similarly, you can see that every, that this T2 is also a special tree. So now that is one part of what we need to prove. Let me uh, show you another thing that is interesting for us. Now that the claim is that if we have T1, T2, and C that are specializing triple, then T1 is not going to weakly embed into T2. Uh, so now, uh, suppose that we have such a weak embedding. Now there is an observation that one can make, which is quite, simple here, it, it is of course quoted in the paper somewhere. What it says, if you have a weak embedding from one tree to another tree, tree then by, this, uh, by changing the definition of F, you can get another embedding, which is still a weak embedding, and it preserves levels. Simply what you do when you have F of X, define G, of x to be f of x restricted to the height of x. So this is quite simple to see. So we can assume that this f reserves level. And now for each limit alpha, we choose x alpha on the alpha level of t1. And we can do that because t1 has height omega 1. Therefore, 
when I look at X alpha and F of X alpha, since they have the same value, which is a limit ordinal, the function C is defined there. So now I'm going to look at this set. C, X alpha, F, X alpha. This set must be countable because C only has a countable limit. Therefore, there must be alpha and beta, such that alpha is less than beta, but C of this pair and C of that pair are the same. Now we obtain by the, one of the defining properties of C that X alpha must be incompatible with X beta and also F X alpha with X, F X beta. But we are interested in X alpha and X beta. So since they are incompatible, we can look at their meeting point inside of T1. This is the delta that we talked about before. But in this kind of trees, we can simply talk about intersections because these are sequences. And what we have, uh, what we know is that since F is strict order preserving, that when we look at this point, this point in the tree T1 is below X alpha and is below F X beta. So F of that point must be below both of them. So that F of that point must be less or equal than the intersection of these two. But we also have the final property of C, which was that it actually drops in the height. So the height of the F of this is equal to the height of X alpha intersected with X beta because F preserves levels. But this must be larger than this because they form part of a C function. And the definition of a C function was that in this case, the height of those is going to be less than the height of those. So we have a contradiction. And that shows us that T1 cannot embed into uh, T2. Okay. So I, as I say, I think that this is a nice new concept, a new way of specializing trees. That's why I have taken time to explain to you uh what it does now let us go back to uh to our slides and show you how we use martin's axiom so no surprise as i said before what we're going to do is whenever we are given a 3t in a we will be able to define a ccc forcing which adds a tree and Aleph one many then sets such that this tree that we had is called T star is in a specializing triple with T with some function C. So as a result, T star is not going to embed into T. And of course, by proving this, we also have another another proof of uh, the Mallet's Baumgart and Mallet's Reinhardt well known theorem that all Aronshine trees are special under MA. And we uh, obtain another proof of Stevo's theorem that uh, says that there are no Aronshine trees universal under weak embeddings under MA. So let me give you the forcing notion for this. So we are given T. What we're going to do is to force something with finite conditions. So the basic idea is, of course, you can guess that we're going to force a function C. We're going to add a tree. So we're going to add finite pieces of this tree T star. So this will be VP and uh, this will be UP and less than P. And VP is going to be a finite part of our given tree T. So this UP, we are, is going to build up to a tree, which is indexed by these ordinals and the root. And how we're going to do this is that we are going to imitate how T looks like inside of VP. Uh, so anytime we have taken something in T and put it in the VP, some alpha, 
then we have also put something in up which has the same height now this order here is a parcel order on our pretended tree on our parcel tree and it's going to be, uh, of course, of the same type as other things in A. So in particular, it's going to preserve order of the ordinal. So if we have alpha is less than beta, then the height of alpha is going to be the height of beta. And we also going to fix the intersection in the tree. It means once we have decided that in one condition U, it's never going to change. And also, it means that the, the, the extensions of this U, of this condition P, are still going to have to preserve this intersection. And it also fixes the root. Now, this CP is a function which will build up to become a function of a specializing triple. So it satisfies all those conditions that the specializing triple has to satisfy. So these are the conditions. And the order in this uh, forcing is given by inclusion, where Q here is a stronger condition. So the stronger condition Q increases U, increases V, increases the order, increases C, and it respects the decisions that we are made in this order about the intersections. That's that's our forcing. So. Let's see. Uh, uh, so, 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 sorry, yes. Mil, yeah, can you, uh, I, I, I'm um, looking at details of this. So, of course, the CP satisfies, I mean, locally, the conditions you want uh, the C to satisfy. The mm -hmm. um, crucial point with the partial order, other than that, is something about the alpha, oh, okay, the levels must somehow uh, be going down also. Uh, okay. No, oh, no, this just that. means that we respect the ordinals. So that okay. if we have two points in the new tree, if one is above the other, then the one okay. that's above is indexed by a bigger ordinal. So number four is really the the, the crucial, uh, you know, piece of the Indeed. definition that, uh, and also and the inequality, uh, you know, height of yes. x one. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Indeed. Indeed. Got it. Thank you. Welcome. So you can see that if we manage to uh, to to uh, do this in a way that generically we cover the whole tree T, uh, we will have a function C that is defined everywhere, and we will have that the union of all those UPs is going to give us a tree because we have defined the partial order, which is a tree order because of this requirement. So this is this requirement which will assure that when we take the union of less than p for p coming from the generic filter, we actually get a tree. And this requirement will assure that the function c is actually the what we need to have. So we need to prove two things, the density, the density, which would be that for every point of T, we can manage to squeeze it into some V, P, and the CCC. And excuse now, me. Yes. Why is UP just a subset of omega one and not of a tree? Well, because we are defining the tree order on UP, which is this. Ah, okay. So you have UP and you put a tree onto a tree structure onto it. Indeed, okay. indeed. Okay, That's you. what this is doing. Okay. Yes. So now, let me remind you of this lemma, which is from uh, from VMR paper. Many people know that uh, the usual requirement on this lemma, which is that the tree to which it applies has countable levels, is not needed. So let me quote it this way. If you have a tree of height and cardinality omega one with no uncountable branches. So this is what we have called a wide Aronshine tree. And if you get a bunch of unco uh, an uncountable family of finite pairwise disjoint subsets of this tree, 
then you will be able to find two of those subsets such that everything that's inside of this is comparable with anything that's inside of that. So let me just show that maybe on a picture because that's a really crucial lemma that uh, is used in this, in all the arguments about Aronshine trees. So I want to make sure that everybody understands it. Let's go back to the, to the slide iPad. It would be good if we were to be able to show both of those screens at the same time. So if anybody knows how to do that, please let us know for the next time. Okay. Uh, so what we have here is that we are working with some tree, tree like that. And we are in the middle of some delta system lemma. We have done some work and we have obtained a family of finite, uh, finite uh, sets of nodes of this T. They all disjoint. And what this crucial lemma says that we will be able to find two of them which have the property that none of those elements here is compatible with none of the elements there. So they are completely incompatible. I think this is the main property of light Aronshain trees that's used perhaps in every single proof about them, at least that I know of. It's very important. But as I say, you never see it written in this form. It's always written about Aronshain trees. But uh, if you look at the classical proof, you'll see that it works exactly the same for wide Aronshain trees. So that is, uh, let's see what else we have here about this proof. Uh, so now uh, I'm running a little bit out of time since uh, this switching between iPad and, and uh, screens doesn't really work as quickly as I would like. So perhaps I will not tell you uh, the details of this proof. I would prefer to go to the next slide, which is now about the other proof. So the other proof is now uh, this theorem. For every wide Aronshine tree, there is a CCC forcing and a family of Aleph one many then set. So filter will add an iron shine tree into which T will be clean bed. So now we're doing it the other way around. Before we had the tree and we wanted to add the tree which doesn't add to it doesn't uh, come in doesn't embed into it. Now we do it the other way around. We get three T and we embed it into an iron shine tree. And this in particular, it tells us that under the assumptions of MA, the class A is cofinal in the class T. So let us see how we do that. Now you probably know that we are going to be forcing the new 3T uh, star by finite conditions. We're going to force our new 3 inside of this structure. So our first tree is already inside of the structure because we have remarked before that all trees in T can be represented as being part of this huge structure. And now we're going to force with finite pieces of the tree, which are now going to be UP, but we are going a new tree, going to add a new tree by those VPs and this UP is going to be closed on the intersections. It's going to be very important. It, we didn't have it in the previous proof. Now we need it in this proof. This is going to be a partial order on VP. F is going to be the embedding that is going to witness what we need. What we need is to embed T into this new tree. So we are going to be embedding UP onto VP. So 
it's going to be a partial weak embedding, of course. And then we are going to have um, that this weak embedding is level preserving. So the height of FP of some eta is the same as the length of eta. And notice since we have represented our tree as being inside of this structure, every element of T is a sequence of countable ordinals. So it has a length. So this whole condition says simply that F preserves levels. And now C. C is not going to be any kind of specializing triple function. It's simply going to be a function like this if we have alpha less than beta in this new order. Uh, Cp is going to be a function into omega, which is going to require this. So this function is sort of like a specializing function, but for the new tree only. It doesn't deal with, with the given tree. Okay, and the extension is given as before by inclusion. There we are. Um, okay. So, any questions? Yes. Yes. In that condition six, you require only that if alpha is below beta, then CP is not equal to, but. Yes. So, what does. Uh, but you don't require that CP of alpha is strictly below CP of beta. It can go the other way around here, right? But no, but this is a function in Torbega. This is the, a specializing function. Yeah, so CP of alpha can be 20 and CP of beta can be nine. Indeed, indeed, it okay. can go anyway, like, yes, thank you. Okay, so let's see, there are two difficult points of the proof. The first one is the density claim. So let's spend some time on this density claim because as I said, that was the subtle point in that Merkel run uh situation. So the density claim uh, is, of course, that we can make the domain of this F star. F star is going to be the generic, the union of all those Fs, so the embedding. And what the dense sets are, simply, you want to be able to have the domain of this equal to the whole tree T. So for every node in the tree T, you want that this set of conditions in the forcing where the node is inside is dense. So that's the density uh, claim. And this is for this density claim that we needed to require that the conditions are closed on the intersection. Because let me show you the main point, main difficulty of such a claim. So you can imagine you're proving this claim uh, you are given some condition P, you are given some rho inside of the tree, and now you need to extend your condition so that uh, it is now inside of the domain of the ex extended F. So a typical condition, rho, a typical situation is this rho. You have to study several cases, but the main difficulty is if the row is in a situation like this, let me just move my picture so I can see it a little bit better. Uh, so if, if row is in a situation like this, you might be in trouble. That is, if you have the row is below some sigma and below some tau, and you have already decided the values of sigma and tau, and you have some tau prime of the same height as tau, and some sigma prime of the same height as sigma. And you have already committed yourself on the extension of tau prime to rho prime and sigma prime uh, to the level of rho, which we will call rho prime, and sigma prime to the level of rho, which we will call rho double prime. Let us look what could go wrong in such a situation. Let us look, look back at the definition of the forcing. Let's 
Okay, so what could go wrong if you have kept this uh, picture in mind is you could have a problem with this requirement. Because now you could have that uh, you have already made up your mind of what C is going to be on those sigma prime and rho prime and rho double prime, etc. And you cannot put them together to, uh, to uh, respect this requirement. That could be a problem. Let me show this picture again. So you see this row might find itself squeezed in a way that it cannot obey uh, what it is supposed to obey. So we have that it C must be less than that and less than that. Uh, and well, okay, you can perhaps think of this a little bit later, but I will tell you that we are saved in this situation because this row cannot actually exist. And the reason that it cannot exist is because sigma and tau are already inside of our condition P. And the condition P has made U be closed on the intersections. So if rho is at the intersection of sigma and tau, then we already have that rho inside of our condition P. So this is at this point where we use the fact that the conditions are closed on the intersections. Now let me go to CCC. So imagine now you have tons of these conditions, omega one, many of them. They are all finite. And the first thing that you, of course, going to do is to apply the delta system lemma. So um, in this delta system lemma, uh, what do we get? Uh, some u's, some v's, some f's, etc. And now we have to put them together. And now we arrive to a similarly dangerous situation. Imagine that we have uh, in our delta system lemma, arrive to the situation when we have two conditions such that the first condition has uh, rho and tau. The second one has, uh, sorry, the first one has rho, rho prime and sigma. And the second one has tau, tau prime and sigma double prime. And now we have actually managed with very routine arguments to put the two conditions together so that there is no contradiction. But now we have to close on the intersections because being closed on the intersections is important for our density claim. So what we need to do is to make an intersection of rho, rho and tau, which we are going to call sigma. And now our problem might be that we have committed, a, you see, if we put sigma here, if this rho prime and rho have the same value of f, and tau and tau prime has the same value of f, then our sigma will be, a, uh, will be below f of those and f of those. So f of sigma must be below everybody. However, in our first condition, we have already committed our opinion of what is f of this sigma. And in our second condition, we have committed to what this sigma double prime gets as f. And if these two halves of this picture come from two different conditions, there is a priori no reason that this f and that f are going to be the same. So it might be that this square and that square are different. And in such a situation, we wouldn't be able to continue because this would not, we wouldn't be able to define f of sigma. Uh, so this is this type of configuration that gets to be complicated in the CCC argument. And we resolve it. Uh, well, you are, of course, uh, welcome to look at this in the paper i told you that it's on my website and on the archive uh, but this is the main idea of the proof let us say and i think 
that uh, now we can just finish the talk just by discussing for a few seconds. Uh, as I mentioned, there is this very beautiful rake by Todorovic on Lipschitz trees, uh, which is co connects also with this mm -hmm. class of coherent trees. It didn't enter into this into this work, but it's interesting. But to do to us, nobody, or Vanalen, nobody knows to, how to answer the following open question. So maybe uh, it will be interesting to think about that. Is there any model in which there is either a maximal Aronschein tree or a maximal wide Aronschein tree? So we do not know any models in which such a thing exists. And as you can see, we have kind of uh, ruled out many of the familiar models because we know that on the CH there is nothing like that. We know that on the Martin axiom there is nothing like that. So we're running out of speed there. And hence, this is an interesting question. So thank you for your attention. That's the end of the talk. Thank you very much, Mirna. Thank you. Thank you. So <laughs> it is thanks. Thank you for uh, this very beautiful lecture. I have uh, some questions, but let us hear if uh, somebody from from the audience have uh, has questions. Let us let us see. Any questions for Mirna? Or any more questions by anyone? Preguntas. Well, maybe I can say something. Okay. Please. Um, so, um, this raises the question of the co-finality of the, 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 the set of trees. Um, because as, with Matis axiom, there are continuum many trees, but it's a co-finality continuum. So, or is it possible that there's a, maybe a, a smaller, smaller, Mm. Um, Family. Co final set of, of trees of, of, of wide arrows and trees. Yes, I, I think that uh, probably by studying this work on coherent trees and Lipschitz trees, there might be some answers to that question, uh, but I don't know them of heart. Uh, I mean, it isn't there. It is not written specifically in those papers. But uh, perhaps one can come to that answer by reading these papers in a different way. I think that um, there cannot be Aleph 1, because Aleph 1 trees you can put together. But, but of course, continuum can be much bigger than Aleph 2 here. Indeed. So, Mm -hmm. uh, in the paper with Meckler, we give uh, examples where there is a, there are Aleph two, but we but we do that with forcing, which is not if I remember right. It's, it's not a, we don't get Matis axiom. Uh, I think you make a uh, special forcing that that does yeah. this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's another open question. Right. Yeah, it's um very subtle. Any any more questions from anybody else? From I don't know, Raul perhaps or uh, Ramiro might have a question or or uh, somebody else. I have a couple of questions, Bill now. Let me yes. uh, see. Uh, the first is a kind of a very wide question. Uh, for for you and uh, and maybe also for Yoko, that you mentioned that these trees, the white and chain trees, uh, I mean you 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 became interested in them, or and also Yoko and uh, and Mechler became interested in them because of their use as clocks for uh, for games, you know, for for tracer games, and I'm now trying to think back the non-maximality. What kind of information would that give? For what kind of logic? Have you tried to pull this information back into some logic, or being able, you know, to show that you have these forcings and so on, and now pull this back to some, I don't know, some some of the nice logics that uh, are floating around where Erin Foyt Freise games 
are crucial. Uh, what what does this give uh, in terms of information? These sort of clocks. Uh -huh. Well, of course, I will uh, just say a few words and then pass on to Yoko, who is the real specialist. But I just like to say that in addition to the Android Fraser games, there are also games like that that appear in descriptive set theory. So in this uh, subject of generalized descriptive set theory, also there are Android Fraser games that are used to, uh, to capture information and also there are uh, so this comes it's also already in a yoko and maker paper they have already uh, proven something in generalized descriptive set theory in this paper which i think might be uh i'd use the occasion to say that this is the first paper in generalized descriptive set theory that is to my knowledge uh, and uh, well so they have already recognized all these possibilities now, perhaps, if you don't mind, Yoko, I will let you answer about the generalized logics question that Andres asked. Um, yes, no, generalized logics, I don't know, uh, but, but it is the model constructions, when one constructs models which uh, are equivalent up to, up to some clock, but not to the sigma of the clock or to the, to the longer clock, or, or in, 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 in other words, they are equivalent in a game of length of, 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 of length something, but not in a bit longer game. Usually one always uses a, a continuum hypothesis. Uh, so that means that there are also these clocks, uh, they, they keep, keep growing. But now in this situation of Matis axiom and, and not CA, it is a completely different situation. First of all, we don't know how to construct the models, which would be highly equivalent. There are some rather recent results of Sela, um, but it's not very, very well, I think, understood. So not only we don't know how to construct the models, and, but also we don't have the clocks. So the clock suddenly stops um, uh, at the maximal, if there is a maximal. I'm, only, I'm really interested in the case that there is a maximal at a three. So that would mean that there would be a maximal clock which would measure sort of all uncountable models. And um, hmm. uh, that would be a very interesting situation, but one hesitates to, 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 to dwell, dwell into it too much before we know that it's even consistent. Suppose there aren't such, it's kind of, then it would be a, a mute, mute question. Um, but uh, on the other hand, if we look at the, the, the other side, this means that um, and the Matis axiom just as it, with CH, um, there is kind of unending, unending family of clocks that, uh, um, so mm, that suggests, I mean, the, the Lipschitz, Lipschitz trees have a rather uh, strong structure theory. So we know exactly under PFA how the Lipschitz trees are. They, it's a sequence of length omega two with kind of kind of balls of uncomparable trees in, 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 a, in a sequence of length omega two. So the structure of the of and in them. fact that answers your questions about the maximality. Sorry to interrupt you because they yeah. are cofinal under MA. So on the PFA, we know that the, the, the cofinality is omega 2. Yes. Yes, yes. And the, yes. Um, hmm. Yes. So we know more under, 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 under PFA. Um, but um, this, it's intriguing, this, this question of, um, a maximal tree. I don't think that it, it is related so much to uh, to new logics, except maybe so called infinitely deep logics. But it's really they are really like transfinite game quantifiers, which are approximated with trees. But uh, if if we consider that a, a new logic, it's of course it was known in the seventies already. Um, um, yeah, I think that. This raises many, many questions, uh, new questions to, to think about these results. Thank you. 
hmm. but uh, about yeah, the, uh, about the uh, generalized descriptive set theory, um, higher uh, descriptive set theory. There, the situation is is similar. In fact, it's kind of analogous that most of the study is under CH, and very little is known under Martin's axiom of of or BFA or MN plus plus or something like this. Uh, maybe something will come come not maybe we don't have to wait too long and something will come also on the not CH side there uh, but um, there um, if we go to the not CH side of, of generalized descriptive set theory then um, also there one can use trees as approximations of uh, of, for example, pi on one sets or sigma on one sets, and um, there we we get if if we know more about the structure of trees, we get like structure theorems for pi on one sets in in higher spaces or sigma on one sets, and maybe also analysis of delta one one. That's yeah. how I think. Well, thank you both, Milan and Jörg, for your. Uh, in response to, to, to this question. Um, in some sense, I just wanted to uh, go back to the universality question and just to mention as a side remark that this duality with respect to universality between, on the one hand, CH, and on the other hand, uh, Martin's axiom, also plays uh, uh, deeply in the search for universality questions in, uh, in abstract elementary classes. So. There are dichotomies exactly like this played exact between alif, alif zero, alif one, alif two. Somehow you don't get universal models in in a, you know in two successors, and then those dichotomies seem to uh, disappear once you go uh, to high enough cardinalities. But there, of course, he, here the question seems to be very very strongly related to to alif one. Because of your, your definition, and we know that untrained trees beyond Ali one behave in a totally different way, which is maybe related. I don't know if this may give additional tools to 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 understand the universality question in general for for AECs, because there 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 are dichotomies and there are very different difficult uh, open questions as as well. I. I well, that sounds very seen. interesting. I, I just want to mention that for the trees, there is work also on other cardinals. So there's a paper that Yoko and I uh, have in which we look at the universal, the analog of this universality question at the successor of a singular cardinal. Okay. And it turns out that if you have a singular cardinal with a strong limit, then uh, it's uh, the, the, the exact number of trees which are of height kappa plus but no kappa plus branch uh, is exactly equal to uh, sorry height kappa but no kappa branch is exactly equal to kappa plus so that's quite a, a, a surprising result but it does connect with what people are now getting with the descriptive set theory uh, point of view uh, now, for the abstract elementary classes, I think it would be very nice if we knew some abstract elementary class which would capture the trees. Do you know of any? Perhaps that's a way to to answer yeah. this question that uh, we have about trees. No, but but but, but, but uh, you know, an old uh, work of yours, Mirna, may actually be uh, you know uh, transformed into that uh, when you were looking. But many years ago. <laughs> I remember you gave these lectures, perhaps I heard them uh, maybe in Carnegie Mellon or something like that in the late 90s. <laughs> you had forcing constructions that were very similar to amalgamation classes and therefore to some version of the uh, ACs. And they were all, all yes. uh, related to the universality question. I wonder mm -hmm. if this may be blended with the trees in some way or another. I, you know, this reminded me of that, of the flavor of that. Work. No, this is certainly very interesting. Uh, I should mention that uh, I have been, as an editor of various journals, getting uh, overwhelmed by a large number of papers on universality that our friend in Jerusalem is producing. In his, yeah. uh, I mean, Sadron yeah. in his renewed uh, work on universality. So many interesting things yeah. will be coming from there as well, I think. 
That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is so. But uh, but this. No, what I mean is that there is something connected to that paper that you mentioned, because in that paper, what we proved is that if you have a SOP three theory, such as for example the triangle free graphs, it is consistent that it has a small universality number with, uh, oh, right. with the yeah, failure yeah, of yeah. siege. And while it is not consistent for it, so P4, this is what uh, what Sarhan had proved before. And right. that's when we tried to somehow put this dividing line between SOP3 and SOP4. Now there are some new conditions which are coming in. But there, the combinatorial core is totally different. I mean, here the combinatorial core, correct me if I'm wrong, seems to be this Baumgartner, Malitz, uh, Reinhardt, uh, result. I mean, there, it is not the only combinatorial. No, uh, no, but that's very important. Yes. But it seems to be. But that seems to be very kind of like finite to uh, uh, to Aleph zero, like between finite and Aleph zero and Aleph one. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there is anything like that beyond or that you know that uh, lemma you quoted from the Yek book and so on. It, it yes. seems to be so so much uh, at the center of. Uh, what works, I, I assume, for diseases. Yes, you're time. right, for any Aronstein trees construction. Well, yes, so this is kind of a uh, delta system lemma raised to the, uh, on steroids, yes. So uh, yes. there are some versions of delta system lemma that work for larger cardinal, uh, but I don't know of anyone which is this strong. Mm. Yeah, this is, so, well, I don't know if there, if there are you know, more questions from, from uh, anybody else in the audience. But if not, let's you know, thank Mirna again. And um, <laughs> thank you. we invite thank uh, you. everybody to join us for Café Logico for, uh, you know, for some coffee. We, we can, you know, I will take some time to prepare, prepare a little bit of coffee, but we leave this session open and uh, just, you know, you can chat for a few minutes. Uh, and, uh, oh, it's great. Okay, so Maria needs yes. to go. Some people, but uh, I think yeah. that you are going to have a better coffee than most of us, have you know, since okay. you are in Colombia. <laughs> but we'll, we'll do what we can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so well, thanks to all for coming. Time. I'll be back in one minute with my coffee mug. And uh, if you have to go, have a nice day, have a good weekend. Okay, okay, okay. So, See you in a second. yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Dinner.